It is great to be joined today by Sam Quinones, who is author of the New York Times bestseller, Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic, and most recently, The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. Uh, Sam, it's great to have you on. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, David. Good to good to be with you. So, I mean, just from just from the titles of the two books, right? There's been a change in in uh, what is happening in the United States as as far as drugs go. Can you talk a little bit about? I mean, how has the landscape changed from when you were researching the first book and then now the second, the next, the most recent one? Sure, of course. It 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 really has changed dramatically, uh, and quite unexpectedly to me, honestly. Um, uh, when I was writing the first book, the idea was to write the story of how we had gone from a country that uh, had uh, decided or a medical establishment that decide, decided the idea was uh, a good one to um, massively and excessively, in my opinion, um, uh, prescribe narcotic painkillers, opioid painkillers for all manner of pain that they had not been used for, with, uh, for before. And, and not just that, but but like lots of refills and, and kind of under, uh, the, with the understanding or the belief that, that these pills would not be at all addictive to anyone who was a, who was a pain patient. That um, helped a lot of people, fair to say. It, it also created an enormous new population of people who actually were addicted to these pills, who depended on these pills. They, they went to the street. Uh, couldn't find them very well on the street. Uh, it was very expensive. And eventually they, a, a certain percentage of those folks um, moved on to, uh, to, to heroin. These pills are, 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 have the drugs in them are very similar to heroin. The underworld um, then took over. And that's what led to the next book. The underworld began, particularly in the Mexican trafficking world, began pr providing the heroin. Um, they then figured out that actually it's a much better idea to make a synthetic form of heroin, which we now know as fentanyl, uh, you don't need any any uh, um, any any of the issues that you know land or any of that kind of stuff, and and so the transformation kind of began, uh, uh, and really about five years ago, not long after Dreamland came out, you began to see fentanyl kind of take over, and and now the country is essentially effectively covered with fentanyl, which is an opioid, but a but a synthetic one. You don't make Use, use plants to make it. And that means that you can make it uh, year round if you have the, the chemicals. At the same time, methamphetamine is also now uh, covered the country because of a new way of making that as well. And so you see really we're in the era of synthetic drugs, whereas before it was, it was the uh, doctors and uh, the classic underworld providing heroin. Now it's pretty much the entire uh, source comes from the underworld and it's now just synthetic. Uh, yeah. In, our in advance of our interview, I read an article that uh, the exact name I now don't remember, but it's something like, uh, can you even really call it meth anymore? And it talks right. about how now this this mechanism called P2P is being used for the manufacture of meth. Can, can you talk about why that's been so crucial to the dominance of meth? Sure, that was an excerpt of the book, in fact, that, that, was, that was run in the Atlantic. Um, and what, what happened with methamphetamine was interesting. Years ago, the Mexican trafficking world um, uh, industrialized the production of meth using a chemical known as ephedrine. Ephedrine is a decongestant. You find it in Sudafed pills. It's chemically very similar to meth. So you a couple of tweaks and it turns into meth. It's, a, it's a, a, a kind of a euphoric Hi, very sociable. You want to be around people. You're jabbering away, and they made huge amounts of it. But they were always limited by the amount of of ephedrine they could get, and they could really get they could get tons of it. But it was really only enough to cover parts of the western United States. Never went east the Mississippi River. Um, eventually, though, the Mexican government got, got got figured this out, and 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 their response was to make ephedrine essentially illegal, except for certain pharmaceutical companies to produce. That meant that the trafficking world now had a whole body of knowledge about methamphetamine and no way to really make it. But there is another way of making methamphetamine. And then they began to um, uh, figure that out. It uses um, a precursor known as, as you said, as you said P2P, phenol 2 propanone. And uh, P2P is actually very messy. It stinks and all that when you turn it into methamphetamine. It does have one benefit, though, to the trafficking world. And that is that you can make it many, many different ways with a lots of, of different 
uh, industrial, widely available industrial chemicals. All these chemicals are legal. They're very toxic. But you can, if the government cracks down on this combination of chemicals, you can use this other one. And there are many of these combinations. So it allows the trafficking world, if they can get the chemicals, to produce this stuff in staggering quantities. And essentially that's what's happening because they have access to two very large ports and several smaller ones on the Pacific coast of, of Mexico through which they get access to the world chemical markets and they can bring in all the chemicals that they like. Some of these chemicals are actually made in Mexico, of course. And so what you begin to see it beginning in about 2012, 13 is the production of it is just staggering. I'm just unbelievable quantities of the stuff so much so that it crosses the mississippi river goes across and now is up into new england effectively covering the country and it's a, it's a remarkable i guess dubious uh, uh, achievement but there's one other thing that that's a, a very much a part of that story and that is this that as this methamphetamine begins to really march across the country first in the western united states then the midwest in 2017 or so, then up into New England in 2019. It's also accompanied by very severe rapid onset symptoms of paranoia uh, uh, and, and, and hallucinations, symptoms of schizophrenia, essentially. Very intense paranoia, very vivid uh, hallucinations, delusions, people. Uh, so it's accompanied by mental illness. And very quickly, that mental illness leads lots of people to be homeless. So you see, as this meth marches across the country, you also find big, big escalations in the amount of mental illness and homelessness, and eventually also uh, tent encampments, because a tent, these folks under in this situation, in this condition, are not going to be living in homeless shelters. Right. I, I want to talk about creepy. that next, because there's been a big this the, these encampments are a big topic of political controversy. And I, as someone who is you know unabashedly on the left, I consider myself a progressive. The, the research I've done makes me question the wisdom of the kind of like let's just leave the encampments because if we don't have a great place to send people, who are we to take away the one place that they found? And the piece for me in all of this that makes me hesitate about taking that approach is it's not when, when you consider the drug addiction component, there seems to be zero possibility that folks get out of that cycle if they remain in the encampment. Now, breaking up the encampment raises all sorts of other questions. Where do people go? Is it safe? It's, I'm not denying that, but it seems that you have no possibility of drilling, dealing with the drug component if the encampments stay. What's your experience with that? No, I would say that, that in talking with people who work with these folks and recovering addicts, uh, as well, I would say that's absolutely true. And it's really uh, actually a little bit more even serious than that, because talking with folks uh, uh, about this, um, uh, you very clearly quickly get the, the idea that there that the effect of this of this methamphetamine is really almost at least semi permanent brain damage. Um, it's not like with ephedrine meth, you would stay up for several days, and you would begin to see kind of shadow people, and then you would sleep it off, and you would return to coherence. Not that this was good for you; it just mm -hmm. was not the damage. Now, now people are saying, and I was just speaking with a homeless shelter provider um, here in Nashville, where I'm now living for for a while, and, and she was saying that the the brain devastation makes it so that you can't really teach these folks to function. So the longer they are exposed out on the street particularly in tent encampments, which really exist as vectors of methamphetamine frequently, even though, of course, tents were meant with good intention. They, they, they're really kind of a place now where, where meth flows, flows freely. That's why they exist, because people, it's like the bar where everybody knows your name in a sense. Well, this is the same thing. And so what, what really is happening is it prolonged exposure to this is, is, is very scary. And, and I've met people who have, who've who've recovered from it and are now sober, but they still know, they tell me, several told me this, I still know I'm not the same. My brain is still not fully healed. And some of these folks have been uh, sober a year or two. There's still that paranoia. There's still that slow, the memory is, is really faded. And certainly it takes weeks, maybe even months for the personality of a person to return. So it's 
the prolonged exposure in these temp cameras, as you say, I think makes it extraordinarily difficult for those folks to ever recover to something close to what they were beforehand. So uh, sometimes you know, it's very popular to talk about Portugal when one talks about drug policy and, and treatment. And one of the things that sometimes folks don't know about Portugal is it's not that in Portugal there's no consequences for drug addiction. It's that they are handled as health issues rather than criminal issues. But there are consequences. There can be mandated treatment. There, people are taken right. out of the equivalent of the encampment, so to speak. So in thinking about solutions, like what, what has worked what, or what might work? Well, I, I, be, I do believe that, the, that some form of mandated treatment is, is what's necessary here, because what you're looking for in all treatment, you have to come to a point where you embrace your sobriety, where you embrace recovery. The problem is that that is not possible on the street today. First of all, you have fentanyl, which will kill you before you ever develop any kind of readiness for treatment, right? The whole idea you need to be ready for treatment. It's true. But the problem is, how do you get there? Where do, and how long does it take? And I, and I think on the street, it's very difficult. And within the meth encampment, um, uh, in the meth world, it's very hard for people to, first of all, in order for recovery to take place, you actually have to have, be, be able to talk rationally with other people. That, that's a human connection that is essential for that process to move to move forward. And if you are speaking in what they call in psychology, word salad, so you, you, the jumbles of words and tumbling out of your mouth, you have no, no idea what people, people have no idea what you're saying. There's no ability to develop that deep connection. So um, first and foremost, detox and prolonged detox, not a few days, but weeks. And then an idea that forced treatment because the drugs um, control is so um, oh, profound. And that's what a, 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 a homeless outreach guy told me. Um, he, he'd been doing this five years. And he says, you know, everybody I've offered treatment to and housing to, when I get them into housing, very quickly, they just bolt and they leave and they run back to the encampment. Mm -hmm. So you need to get people away from that someplace secure, someplace where they are mandated treatment, someplace where they begin the process, the careful, nudging, gradual process of coming to embrace their own sobriety, which will happen, but it does need that separation from. Yeah, the that's an important point, which is when when addiction is a factor, just giving homeless folks homes alone does not actually uh, so solve the problem. Are there communities in the U.S. that are doing this correctly? I mean, I think with methamphetamine, it's so new. Um, the story really, I, I, was, I broke this story in the book and in this, in this thing in the Atlantic, you know, about methamphetamine. And I think many communities kind of almost didn't know what they had. First of all, COVID has kind of overshadowed everything last year or two. And then before that, the opioid epidemic overshadowed the meth thing. So people have really not, come to understand the, the the deep issues involved with methamphetamine some places of uh oh sam we just lost you we first lost your video and then we lost your audio now you're back sorry yeah you, you just glitched for for a moment there really okay. yeah but now you're back you're, you're smooth now uh, okay well um I, I would say that that a lot of places have, are still trying to figure this thing out because first of all i think the opioid epidemic overshadowed uh, the meth problem. And then also then COVID did the same. Yeah. So what we're seeing now is people are just kind of now coming to understand this. I would say that in Clarksburg, West Virginia, I write about in the book, several chapters in the book, they tried the housing first idea. And the folks that they put into housing, destroyed. there was some refurbished apartments that they were able to put them in, and, and they destroyed the apartments. They, they you know, like $100,000 worth of damage to these apartments. There was no way they could do it. So I think people are just now, I mean, really, because the story just I'm just breaking with this book and all, people are just now become, coming to the point where they're saying, let's see if what we can try. I spoke with some with a with some, a, 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 a politician in in Northern California who was thinking. Um, we were talking about the possibility of using uh, uh, empty big box stores to put a kind of controlled tent encampment, like put tents but within a secure big box store controlled entry and exit and so on, and have that be a place where maybe people detox for the first, but I haven't found anybody who's been able to deal 
um, significantly with this issue that, that this new meth coming out of Mexico has presented over the last several years? Um, sometimes people will call in and they'll say, hey, are you for legalization of all drugs, just like we're starting to see with cannabis in, in some states? And, you know, I I feel very strongly that decriminalization is really important, and it's it, there, there's a number of reasons why that seems like an easier thing to think about, and there are good examples from around the world. When I think about like recreational meth or recreational heroin, these drugs seem so destructive to just one's basic ability to exist in the world that I, I have not been convinced that recreational legalization of these makes any sense. How do you conceive of this issue? No, I, 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 I think not. I guess, you know, I would like to see, here's what I would like to see, I guess, first. I would like to see us um, legalize marijuana in a mature and adult way. Mm -hmm. We are doing it as if, you know, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a consumable, um, then we need to have those places inspected like food factories are inspected. If it's a medicine, we need to have them inspected like like factories that produce drugs are, are inspected. I think it's absolutely insane in a time of climate change that we allow indoor grown marijuana, a, mm. a, a plant that grows beautifully outdoors. We sh that should not be possible. And the idea too, that we are not gonna after all, now we're gonna be arresting people for selling marijuana is, is crazy too. Now you're seeing dispensaries in California say we have to compete now with illegal vendors who don't have to pay taxes or electricity or rent and all the rest. And, uh, and so you need to lower our taxes. No, what we need to do is we need a prolonged, prolonged time period, probably many years of very aggressive enforcement of people who are selling the, the drug illegally so that there won't be that, that unfair um, competition for folks who actually have to pay rent and electricity and taxes and all the rest that we want for like any liquor store or mm. any, any other place. You know, to me, this feels like, uh, and I also believe that we need to, to really question what the potency should be that we allow for, to, for commercial, for commercial sale. It's, it's insane. 40% THC, 90% THC and vapes and this kind of, I mean, and and these little candy things. I mean, you know, when Joe Camel started marketing cigarettes to kids, the entire country was up in arms. And yet it's OK to have these little gummy bears and all, all that kind of stuff. To me, it feels like and I think part of this grows from the fact that we still don't have federal uh, marijuana legislation, really right. federal marijuana legislation needs to put all of this and much more uh, in, in, in into place. But a lot of this stuff seems to me to be almost juvenile like it doesn't really matter dude it's just pot well it's it's not pot it's very potent stuff and it needs to be treated that way and we need to approach it like adults i want to see that done first and then we can turn our, our 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 attention to whether other drugs but i don't really see it happening until yeah. we do this right no doubt about it uh, the latest book is the least of us true tales of america and hope in the time of fentanyl and meth We've been speaking with the book's author, Sam Quinones. Sam, great having you on today. Love being with you, David. Thanks so much.